for over a decade, I shopped and worked at my local comic shop. One of the best parts about hanging out there was comparing notes on what I was reading with folks who shared my passion for comics. My comic shop is gone now, but we can still hold on to the magic of that in-store discussion. This is My Comic Shop Book Club. Welcome to My Comic Shop Book Club. I am your host, Anthony Desiato. Joining me to discuss the Marvel Color Series by Jeff Loeb and Tim Sale is Jeremy Frutkin. Welcome. Anthony, thank you so much for having me. I'm very happy to be here. Yeah, th- I've been looking forward to this. And, you know, the, the name of this show is My Comic Shop Book Club. Uh, we met through uh, our old comic shop, The Late Alternate Realities. In, That's exactly in, right. In Scarsdale, New York. I work there. You were a customer. How long did you shop there for? Oh, it, easily it had to be eight to 10 years. I mean, pretty much from uh, high school all the way through college to a few years after college, me and uh, my buddy, Will, who I used to always uh, come in with, we try to make it at least like a weekly thing if we could. Nice. You know, it's funny. And I don't know, you can help me out. Maybe you remember more specifically, but I, I don't feel like we, we had that many conversations over the years. No, kind of just like a few here and there, kind of just in passing. But I, man, you correct me if, if I'm wrong, but I feel like once we became connected on social media and we started being like, wait, of course, we like a lot of the same things. A lot of this is in our, our wheelhouse. Clearly, we're both very much into comic books and like having discussions. I feel like that's kind of what uh, led to us hitting it off. Yeah, for sure. No, and, and that is primarily how we've kept in touch as uh, through social media. It's funny. I never told you this, but I remember it was probably like the first time that we actually spoke, like we actually had a conversation at the store. And I don't know, like a week or so later, someone came in who I mistook for you. <laughs> and I didn't, I, I, I don't, I didn't go so far. I wasn't like, hey, Jeremy, I didn't do that. <laughs> But I definitely thought it was you. And I was like, hey, man, like he didn't really say much. And I was like, well, all right. And then as he was in there longer, I was like, oh, that's not the same guy. (laughs) So, yeah, what I just I'm I'm a a forgettable person. It's not that I think it was uh, a doppelganger. No, clone saga time. Here we go. Oh, man. Listen, that's coming on the on the book club podcast at some point, I think. (laughs) Oh, oh, goodness. I'll get my blue hoodie nice and ready. You know what I mean? Yes. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. No. And also like he came in and, you know, I, the, the glare was coming in from the window and I was, I was over by the, the wall. There was a bit of a distance. So it's not that you're forgettable, but I think he bore a resemblance in between the distance and the glare. And maybe I just wanted to talk to you. I think it might've been that. You, you know what? You, you manifested it. You wanted to manifest me being there. And if, if I could have been there, I would, but you know, I, I'll say this joking aside, that happens to me or people have told me a similar story so many times in my life. I don't know what it is exactly. People will come up to me and even be like, oh, yeah, I know you. You're so-and-so's son. Or, yeah, don't you remember? And I'm like, no, man. Like, that's not me. (laughs) So, lifetime full of painfully awkward but well-meaning conversations. (laughs) Gotcha. Uh, So, yeah, this is, I think this will be a really fun episode. So, again, this is the Marvel Color Series. So, specifically, it's a quartet of miniseries by the same creators, writer Jeff Loeb, artist Tim Sale, and we were talking about Daredevil Yellow, Spider-Man Blue, Hulk Gray, and Captain America White. These are among my favorite comic stories generally, definitely among my favorite Marvel stories, and Spider-Man Blue is my favorite Spider-Man story. I'm going to go on record as saying that. What about, where do they fall for you? I'm not going to be a copycat and I'm not going to jump off the bridge with you, but it is going to sound like I am because I've already told you how wonderfully excited I was to share these. These are hands down among the best comic book stories, in my opinion, in my viewpoint, ever printed. Um, They're the most emotionally impactful. They are so accessible. You can give one of these to somebody who maybe just saw uh, a Netflix show or a Marvel movie or a Disney Plus show and be like, you know, I never really read comics. And if you want to know who these characters are, all you have to do is give them that collected uh, anthology, their stories through this. And you get such a perfect snapshot of who these characters are. So for a while, Spider-Man Blue was my favorite Spider-Man story as well. I still think it might be, but I kind of buried the lead with this one with my background here and my rereading, which I found super surprising. I actually think this time around, I enjoyed Daredevil Yellow more, but we can get into that in a little bit. Okay. Very interesting. And did you, mm-hmm. did you position yourself purposely such that it, it looks like, uh, like your head is in the place of, of Daredevil's head? Cause it, you really, it works pretty well. <laughs> 
if that makes me seem uh, more prepared and smarter, then yes, that's absolutely what I did. Uh, that's great. No, I mean, you know, I've I've been a fan of these for a really, really long time. I will confess, I read yellow, blue, and gray as they were coming out. So this is going back to the early th- 2000s now. Yep. Uh, Captain America White came out significantly later, and it was delayed by many years. I think it was originally supposed to come out like 2008, and it didn't come out till... 2015. 2015. So yep. crazy. And so by that point, I don't know, for whatever reason, it just wasn't on my radar. So I hadn't read that until this reread. But the others I read as they were coming out, and they, they've long been favorites of mine for exactly the reasons you said. They are so uh, uh, emotional. They're bittersweet tales. Uh, they're love letters. Uh, like you said, and I think this is a big piece of it, they really do give you great snapshots of uh, of these characters at very specific points, uh, you know, at the beginnings of their careers, uh, when you describe them to, to someone specifically someone like not, not in the comics world or hype, or if you haven't hypothetically, if you were to, how do you describe them or how would you describe like one of, one of these stories to someone? Uh, so I would describe them as a, the easiest way to understand these characters that maybe you're seeing somewhere else, whether it is uh, in a TV or a movie or a video game, what have you, it's the easiest way to understand them in a fundamental level. But also, I think it's the best way to start your entry into comic books, because I think so many people still can be so off put being like, oh, I, you know, I love comic books. I want to jump in, but I don't know where to start. There's so much available to me. And like we said, if you read any one of these selected characters, uh, collected issues throughout the color series here, you will come away being like, not only do I understand the principal characters, the class, it's a a classic version that populate this character's life, but you'll understand not only their powers, uh, their villains, but you'll really understand who they are and how their tragedy kind of has informed who they are going forward as they might know them now currently. Yeah. Well said. Uh, You hit the nail on the head. I mean, that really sums them up. And, you know, that's actually one of the reasons why uh, I, so this is actually going to be the second episode of the My Comic Shop Book Club series. And, you know, for people who have followed the other podcasts I've done over the years, like I've dabbled in book club episodes here and there. And, and whenever I've done it, it's always been DC because that's, I'm ultimately a DC guy at heart. Uh, sure. I love those characters, sure. but I am a Marvel fan as well. And uh, for my first Marvel book club, I felt like this was a perfect choice because, again, you 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 know you get a nice uh, a nice little sampling of, of four different characters, and uh, and they are really amazing um, and effective uh, encapsulations of those characters. Uh, so I thought for my first time talking Marvel uh, <laughs> on a on a podcast for an hour or so, uh, this would be a good place to start. You know. For sure. And, and uh, full disclosure, I didn't realize this was your first time doing a, a Marvel uh, book club episode. So I'm honored and thank you. I'm, what a choice to uh, to have me be a part of it. Yeah, for sure. You know, we've been talking about, you know, doing something uh, podcast wise. And then I think I, yeah. I threw out a few suggestions and you immediately jumped on the color series and I was like, let's do it. Um, yeah. Are you a fan of of Loeb and Sales? Not look already. I'm bringing it back to D.C., but are you, are you a fan of their uh, of their uh, D.C. collaborations as well? So I am, I am, I read a bunch of Batman, like so many, so many of us had as well too. I still think that uh, great works to be had throughout uh, their DC runs and everything as well too. But uh, to me, I mean, this has got to be the high marks of their career. I I think it's like, to me, it's one of the high parts, uh, high marks in comic books in the last 30, 40 years, maybe ever. Yeah, no, for sure. Absolutely. And I know uh, Jeff Loeb, if I'm not mistaken, uh, has had quite a career trajectory as well, too, even with Marvel and climbing up the ranks. And I think even informing um, whether it's I don't know from the top of my head, if it's executive producer or something, but informing a bunch of the Marvel programming even as well, too. So it's kind of cool, even retroactively to go back and kind of see this uh, that happened when these came out almost 20 years ago. Right. These were out in the early 2000s, except for Captain America White, which I'm glad you brought that up. I had read all these and then I was reading it. I actually have here in my notes, it says Captain America White 2008 to 2015, you know, exclamation point, question mark. I don't think I ever read the last issue okay. to Captain America White because I was like, this can't be right. Cause I definitely remember reading this in like 2008, but I, I completely slipped my mind that there were delays. And so that's a, that was a very fascinating thing to kind of go back and, and read that in a, its totality now as well. Yeah, for sure. So, 
again, I have to double check all the dates and everything. If memory serves, so they were all six issue miniseries, but the first three were, you know, issues one through six. Captain America, they did a zero issue. And I believe, uh, I believe that actually came out uh, in 2008. And then the rest of the series, you know, it, it took years before it finally came out. I, I believe that was sort of the, uh, the sequence of events there. Yeah, it's it's quite a quite a gap in time, but it's a uh, it's always nice to go back and have them all collected in one place. So that's that's always nice. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I don't know how I know you took notes on all of these. Um, do you have any oh, preferences? Sure do you have any preferences for uh, for how we how we talk about these? Like, do you want to talk about them collectively and then kind of go through each one, or or you just want to jump around? What do you want to do? That that sounds. We can talk about them collectively and uh, do uh, kind of our our notes and impressions of each one. That sounds good. All right, I'll say this, and then I'll I'll pass the baton off to you. I think, um, and we've already we've already touched on this, but I'll, I'll just kind of elaborate a little bit. I think, not I think, I know why I love these so much is that, um, you know, it's a different kind of superhero story. It's not really a superhero story, right? Like they're really love stories um, with a superhero cast and against a superhero backdrop. And I think that's why I enjoyed them initially. I think that's why they've stood the test of time. And that's why, like each time I read these, and with the exception of White, I've read them all multiple times. And I think I enjoy them more each time. And it kind of calls to mind, even though they're very different genres, but it does call to mind Gotham Central in the Bat universe. Not, again, not to bring up DC, but, you know, these instances of, you know, and especially for me, like when these came out, I mean, I was, you know, like high school age. And so to see, and I know we're you know about the same age as well. So, but it's like, as they were coming out, I was like, wow, it's like, you can tell different kinds of stories, you know, with these, with these superheroes and, and with these in particular, you know, the, the common theme among all of them is, is lost love. And with Daredevil and Spider-Man and Hulk, it's a romantic love. And in the case of, of Captain America and Bucky, we have more of a brotherly or even paternal love. Um, but still the, the lost love and these framing devices where these characters are, are looking back and talking to these characters that they've lost. And along the way, um, you know, like you said, like really giving us a snapshot of, uh, you know, a point in time early in their careers. Uh, so, you know, thematically, again, they're all, they're all very bittersweet, uh, love letters. Uh, and, and again, I, I think I enjoy them more each time I, I read them. Yeah. I mean, uh, absolutely huge agreement from me. I'm a, I was so surprised with how much new information I got and how much new things I was picking up on as I was reading it. And what's so cool about comics in general is they don't just happen and they're done. And I have some more comments on this as we go through the individual stories later, but seeing what's happened to these characters since it's so interesting now reading this and it kind of gives a bunch of it, a bunch of new context as well, which I thought was really cool reading this. Oh, that's such a great point. I, I thought the same thing too, because, you know, it, you know, Daredevil's um, writing a letter to to Karen Page. Uh, Peter Parker is recording a message to Gwen Stacy. Uh, Bruce Banner is having a uh, middle of the night therapy session uh, with with Doc Samson about Doc Samson about Betty, and uh, and Steve Rogers is looking back talking, uh, you know, to to Bucky, right? And it, it that's a great point because Betty came back. Right. And in, in Hulk, Bucky, of course, famously yeah. came back. Yeah. And while while Gwen proper hasn't returned, we have had Spider Gwen and, and you sure. know, all that other stuff, you know, dancing around. So I know it really is interesting, you know, to like you said, to see what's come since then. Yeah, it's uh, I mean, it's it's the old I guess maybe that's what such the appeal is to me, because it's just that old uh, joke or not even joke, really just true statement about how nobody ever stays dead in comic books. And I think part of the appeal is that death is treated with such gravitas and it's not like, Oh, somebody's going to die in this comic. It's somebody important to me died. And this is how my world is still going on after that. I think that's also part of the appeal as well too. It's not, you know, uh, in this issue, you're going to see a shocking death. It's like, Hey, this happened quite some time ago, years ago, in most of the cases in these collections. And uh, it's about how, you move forward, not move on, but move forward. And that's something that like all good stories, no matter the medium, every one of us, unfortunately can relate to. And there's so much uh, emotional intelligence 
to being able to tell a story that, like you said before, even though it's a superhero story, it's really a bunch of love stories. And that has such a universal appeal and impact to uh, anyone. You know, I remember giving my dad uh, Daredevil Yellow and Spider-Man Blue, and he loved it. He absolutely loved it because they're they're just good stories at the end of the day. Yeah, 100%. And I mean, do you agree that, you know, because of the way they're written and the way they're structured uh, and, and the fact that they, they are these love letters, they don't lose their impact by virtue of the fact that a few of the characters who are being written about have returned, right? Like the, they still sure. work, even though the, some of the characters have come back, right? Like I don't feel like the returns undermine these stories. At, with, out of shadow, I mean, first of all, they can't be held accountable for things that happened after them. Right. Uh, but it, it doesn't matter because within the parameters of this story, you know that, this protagonist lost somebody and that it's real and that in itself is enough because it's not even necessarily so much about who specifically what character died it's about that universal feeling that unfortunately everybody can relate to of you know losing somebody whether it's a relationship whether it's an actual death and that's such a universal uh and important feeling especially maybe for people who aren't the best at communicating about it verbally. It's so comforting uh, in a way to read something and be like, hey, even these these superheroes who do these amazing things. And there's one line in Spider-Man Blue, I think where uh, Connor's kid uh, says, oh, that's Spider-Man. He has it all, you know? And that's such a, a powerful line to me that jumped out this time because he's talking about how he lost the love of his life. And, you know, he's battling the flu. He's he's not having any time to, you know, typical Peter Parker problems. But from his perspective, you know, he's he's got everything. He's Spider-Man. But this really shows us internally that just like all of us, they have emotions. Regret, I think, is a big theme throughout all of this regret. And um, again, how not how you move on or forget, but how you remember and move forward. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, it's interesting, too. I think one of the other reasons why the stories are able to transcend like whatever might happen in the comics afterward is that, you know, as much as Hulk gray is about Bruce's love, you know, lost love of, of Betty, it's almost as much about Thunderbolt Ross and that dynamic and yes. daredevil, yes. same thing. It's like, as much as it's about Karen, it's as much about his father as well. So like, there's mm -hmm. so much going on. Um, and I think, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, certainly the, you know, the lost love, uh, you know, is, is a main driving theme and something that connects all of them. But there there's a lot going on, uh, you know, in, in these stories. And, yeah, they, they humanize these characters to, to such a strong degree. And, you know, the other thing that popped into my head while, while you were saying all that is um, I think these stories illustrate, too, the value in having characters who have kind of like been around the block for a while. You know, I know there's always like a push to like keep the characters young and reboot and all that stuff, but it's like mm -hmm. you wouldn't have this story <laughs> like, you know, in the ultimate universe, for example, or, or, or whatever. Yeah. It's like the fact that these characters, like they've lived, they've lived and they've loved and they've lost and they're looking back. And um, yeah, I think it fantastic results. You know, I, I hope that people, you know, tuning in to this, to this podcast have, uh, have read the books. I mean, we will be talking about them and so there will be spoilers, uh, but for anyone who hasn't, I mean, I, I can't recommend them enough. And, you know, there's usually a double meaning, right? With the, with the color uh, in, in the yep. title for each of these books. So of course, you know, for Daredevil, it's like, yes, initially he had a yellow costume before his red one. Um, but the jumping off point for the story is his fear over living in a world without Karen. So the yellow kind of plays both ways. Same thing with Hulk and um, his original green, uh, gray pigmentation gray. Yeah. and also, yep. you know, sort of being a, a piece of gray in, you know, in a black and white world, you know, that sort of yep. thing. So, uh, so yeah, that works on a, on a couple of levels too. It sure does. It sure does. They, uh, they color the emotional spectrum, if you will, is the whole uh, general theme. Yeah. You know, I, I, before we sort of, uh, you know, dive into each one a little bit more specifically, there was a, a kind of a big picture question that I was curious to get your your thoughts about. So, uh, you know, we can draw a bit of a line, right, between uh, yellow, blue, gray, and white, right? And, you know, the, the main thing that separates them is, is, you know, with the first three, we have lost loves, uh, you know, romantic loves. And in the case of Captain America White, it's this this best friend, partner, you know, almost brother, right, in, in the form mm -hmm. of Bucky. In reading the first three and, and looking at the way the stories treat or depict 
uh, Gwen and Karen and Betty, you know, they're all, you know, beautiful and young and sweet and innocent, right? Um, and in the case of Bucky, you know, you you he gets a lot more to do. Like he's a much bigger part of the action. Like he's in mm -hmm. in the war in battle with Steve side by side. So, you know, I think he gets, you know, he gets a lot more play. I mean, I don't know. Do you looking at at again the way uh, the three women are are presented, I mean, do you think you know, there was any sort of missed opportunity to kind of maybe flesh them out a little bit more or, or you know, give us a little bit more insight into their into their characters and personalities? Or was it fitting, especially given the fact that it was these three guys looking back on, on what they had lost? So that's a, a fantastic point and a great question. One of the things that I struck me this time with my read through is something that uh, Peter says when um, I think it's when Gwen and MJ are both in bed trying to feed him and take care of him. And he even says, as he's, you know, speaking into his tape recorder, uh, that might not be the way it happened, but it's the way I choose to remember it. Yeah. And that made me really think, I wonder if these stories are just how our narrators or our protagonists are choosing to remember it, not to discredit them and saying that they're completely unreliable narrators. But I think it's um, so easy to look back in nostalgia and with rose colored glasses. And that kind of adds a whole nother level to this as well. So maybe it wasn't even necessarily how they were, but more of um, an idealized image of how they remembered them. Maybe even just of how their emotions kind of manifested and informed their memories of them. Yeah. No, that makes sense. I, I, I would agree with that. Uh, and, you know, you know, like you said, you know, you can give these stories to someone who, again, maybe just watched the show or watched a movie or has no exposure to these characters. And, and they are great introductions. And I'll be honest, man, like even for myself, like because I, I was really thinking about this, uh, you know, I read the you know, the two part storyline where Gwen Stacy died. I didn't ever really yeah. read a ton of stories when Gwen was alive. Right. And so, you know, I, I why, why would you, they happened so long ago in our, <laughs> here in our real world. I mean, right. If you think about it, like, you know, that's a much harder yeah. thing to, to go back. And of course now that we're, you know, older, but especially when we're younger, you know, growing up reading comics in, you know, the nineties, you know, there's so much else going on, you know, we've got like, you know, the clone, uh, clone saga, we've got onslaught, all this stuff that was awesome back then. In hindsight, that's fully debatable. I'll leave that for other episodes. But uh, it's just that why as a kid would you go back when you're caught up in all this other stuff? And I actually have an interesting point I was saving for Spider-Man Blue, but that's a perfect segue you just gave away. I actually think reading it this time, Spider-Man Blue does so much more to highlight Mary Jane than it does Gwen Stacy. And I actually think it's not just the best Spider-Man story, but it is definitely the best Mary Jane story. And I think my favorite Mary Jane moment of all time is also in that book. What What is it? So it's right at the end where uh, she walks in or I get not walks in. She, Peter realizes that Mary Jane's been listening to him for a while and you know, you don't know how she's going to react. This was his former love. She's also her friend. And Mary Jane just says, you know, you know, tell her I said hi and that I miss her too. And, it shows such character growth and depth, and it kind of gives you the idea that it's entirely possible that if Gwen Stacy hadn't have died, Mary Jane wouldn't have matured, grown up, and the two of them wouldn't have gotten together, not just because Gwen's out of the picture, but because maybe Mary Jane wouldn't have been forced to emotionally grow up and realize how fleeting life can ultimately be. And uh, that's like more character growth in a short, short amount of time that I've seen maybe anywhere ever. I mean, it's just, it's such a remarkable statement on something that I hadn't really, to be honest with you, spent too much time even really considering before reading this time around. Yeah, that's a great point. And, you know, like I was saying before, it's like, just like, you know, with, with uh, Yellow, it's as much about battling Jack Murdoch as it is about Karen Page. Almost yeah. more so, I think you could make the argument. Like, they really spend a lot of time on that, uh, you know, that, that relationship. For sure. Um, but similarly, too, with Spider-Man Blue, it's like, yes, it's about Gwen, but it, it's very much about MJ. And I agree. I love that moment uh, at the end as well. You know, it's funny, like, as I was reading it, and again, I've, I've read it multiple times, but I guess this is the first time since I've been a married, <laughs> married man. And I was like, she, you know, 
it's just almost too like it's almost unbelievable how understanding you know she is without it, it might be the biggest shock of the entire series <laughs> like in its own way and i think that's what makes it so powerful because you've seen through uh peter's memories one mary jane and this is the only time you've seen what we could best describe as modern or even real mary jane and there's such like a powerful dynamic in that little scene and shift that uh, it's it's just it's such a good ending. It, it's such a good ending to that story and such a nice emotional kind of uh, deep breath and catharsis almost with her saying that. Yeah, for I know. I, I think, yeah, the story has to end that way. Right. So like throughout the story, Peter's talking into a tape recorder on Valentine's Day because he's feeling blue because he misses Gwen, yeah. you know, not like jazz, but in feeling blue, right in feeling blue. <laughs> And, uh, you know, it ends with, like you said, like with Mary Jane coming in, like she's been listening and, and she's not mad. She's not hurt. She just tells Peter to tell Gwen that, you know, she misses her too. And, yeah. uh, yeah, I mean, like you said, I mean, it speaks volumes about the character and yeah, I feel like you need that button on the story. Cause like if Mary Jane didn't appear, I feel like there would almost be this element of like, was Peter like, you know, trying to keep this from her, you know, I don't know. I don't know how, if that would have, yeah. would have played as well. Um, but yeah, to have that and to have her react the way she did, uh, again, really did speak volumes about the character. Uh, it, it was, yeah, it really was such a great moment. I, I, I love that a lot too. One of the best really. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I guess like one other big picture thing, um, cause I, I, you know, we'd be remiss if we didn't, uh, if we didn't talk about the art. Uh, I mean, I, you know, I, I just love, you know, what, they're such a great team, uh, Loeb and Sal. Yes. And, you know, one of the things yes. that's, that Loeb is often lauded for is, you know, the way that he's able to write to the strengths of whichever artist he's working with. And, you know, he tends to attract, like, t you know, top talent in common. You look at everything that he's done, and, you know, it's, it's Jim Lee, and it's Ed McGinnis, and it's Tim Sale. Um, but you know, I, like, they're such a great team. And um, it's funny, I don't have a ton really to say specifically other than I love the, you know, the quality that, that sale brings to the work and the, you know, the emotion that he's able to depict and, and just the feelings that his, his art conjures. What about you? It's, I can't imagine another artist to tackle this project, to, to, to really bring this book the life, to life the way Tim Sale did without a shadow of a doubt. He creates, the art is so accessible, but it's also, somehow both fresh and nostalgic at the same time. Like you really get the idea that like what you're looking at is vibrant and alive and happening, but it also happened a while ago. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great way to describe it. And I mean, he lives in that, in that sweet spot. I mean, you look at, you know, I mean, I don't know, like virtually everything he's done, um, you know, again, like long Halloween and dark victory, like the year yeah. one, year two era for Batman, uh, for all seasons, one of my favorite Superman stories. So good. Uh, even Superman Kryptonite, which Darwin Cook wrote, uh, which is great, uh, kind of an underrated, like under the radar story. And I don't know that it ever got like a ton of attention, but about Superman's first interaction with Kryptonite. So yeah, I mean, he really excels in this, uh, you know, uh, you know, the, the, the look back and, you know, one other thing that I was just thinking of, you know, because when you said like, why would I go back and read, you know, those earlier Gwen Stacy stories? And, you know, I, I will admit, uh, I mean, look, I've read, you know, I've read Amazing Sp uh, Fantasy 15 and Amazing Spider-Man 1. And I've, I, you sure. know, I've jumped around, like I've read some of the stuff from the, from the 60s, but whether it's DC or Marvel, you know, historically, like, yeah, I, I've had a tough time going back and like really trying to sink my teeth into a lot of those older Same. stories. Yeah. Same. And that, that, that might be an unpopular thing to say, but I also think it's the truth. I'm not saying those things aren't important, don't have tremendous value. And I still will go back and try, especially now with the advent of, uh, you know, um, DC universe and Marvel unlimited, where yeah. it's so much easier to do it, you know, easier than ever, but it's just, we're very much products of the environment and the style in which we grew up in and started reading in. And that just was not our era. And what they've done with these uh, color series is created, I think, an accessible way for people our age and really now any age to kind of look back and get an idea. And that would even be a good starting point to be like, Oh, you know what? I'm kind of interested more in this era of, uh, of daredevil or Hulk or Spider-Man or cap, you know, to, to go back. But I think without this segue, it is, it's hard. I've gone back and tried to read a bunch of comics. The language is different. And that sounds like silly, but like, it's, it's different. I read a bunch of plastic man comics from the 1940s, my dad's favorite superhero, and I love them, but oh man, it is very different. <laughs> it is very, very different. And I, I'm not saying it's bad. It's just not what we 
grew up with and grew into. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing, you know, I'm with you totally. And it's like, you know, I would never try to take away like from anyone's enjoyment of them. And, and I, it, the thing is, you know, you look at those stories and it's like, yeah, I could totally see if, you know, you're, a, you know, a kid reading these, you're growing up with them. Like, of course they would make such an impression. And, and I can appreciate how, you know, Marvel was innovative, you know, at, at the time, um, you know, so like I can appreciate all of that, but at the same time, you know, any, any instance where I've like really tried to sit down and like plow my way through it, it yeah, it's tough. I mean, the sensibilities were different. They were written for a younger audience. Um, highly expository i mean it's like it's not an exaggeration to say like you would have a caption explaining what was happening you know the character thinking what was happening and the character there are (laughs) so many thought bubbles and exposition boxes just everywhere everywhere different style it was a different time different style you know but you know what in 30 years they're going to be saying that about the stuff that we like except maybe for these series i hope i do actually believe that these i think are timeless but yeah we'll see no, I, I mean, you know, look, they've already, it's already been almost 20 years since, uh, yeah. since yellow came out. And I, I mean, yeah. it, it, it reads just as great now, uh, you know, as ever. So, uh, I, I like to think that these will stand the test of time and, and yeah, they are, they really are a great way, you know, if you're curious about, you know, those older stories and, and characters, you know, but it, like us, you know, it's kind of hard to, to really, uh, dig into them. Like these mini series are really a great way to experience that. And, you know, it's funny, I haven't, I guess I haven't tried to go back and read the older story since, you know, rereading these miniseries, but I wonder if I, it might be a little bit easier because it's like, I feel like I have more of a connection to the, to that era and to those characters now through these books. Uh, Definitely. Without a doubt. I feel like this provides such a, a nice gateway and segue into that world because now you've seen it through a more, at least to what us, uh, for us as a more contemporary lens um it's easier with that in mind to be like okay i understand the world that i'm stepping into now a little better and i have an appreciation for this time period and these characters so i think it would definitely be an easier pill to swallow for sure uh let's take a quick uh, 30 second commercial break and then when we come back uh we'll start to dive in more specifically into each of the mini series yeah sounds good all right cool be right back the hive comics and games is an oasis of nerd fun and events in the heart of odessa texas Whether it's comic book superhero stories or role-playing in a dungeon, the Hive is where to be. Come tap your mana and face off against the top Magic the Gathering players in West Texas. Hive carries a majority of new comic titles each Wednesday and has all of your favorite titles in their back issue section. Follow them on Facebook at The Hive Comics and on Instagram at The Hive Comic Shop. All right, and we're back. Uh, So Daredevil Yellow... You know, you and I are both uh, relatively new fathers. Did did this story yes. did this story hit you in a different way uh, since becoming a, a dad? Just you know, just like when you start with your left, I never saw it coming. To quote Daredevil Yellow, you know, for sure. I I've always loved uh, Daredevil is among my my favorite uh, comic book characters of of all time, without a doubt, interchangeably within the top one, two, or three, depending on the mood, the day, the hour. Uh, I've always appreciated his origin story, but now as a father, uh, seeing Matt's dad, who is so human and flawed, but ultimately does the right thing at the greatest cost that a human being can possibly do, and knowing that he did it to show his child the difference between right and wrong to say, Hey, be better than me. Uh, so impactful as a father now, without a doubt. I got chills as you, as you were saying that, uh, no, I mean that I identify with that totally. Daredevil has long been one of my favorites. Uh, Again, definitely one of my favorite Marvel characters, probably honestly for me at, at, on the Marvel side, it's Spider-Man Daredevil. Uh, and Daredevil is one of my favorite comics characters. Generally, I went to law school Rocky is uh, one of my favorite movie characters and movie franchises. So, you know, the boxing aspect and the legal aspect and now, you know, the father son dynamic like this, this checks off a lot of boxes for me. You're you're the target audience, my friend. That's (laughs) it. It's great. And, you know, I I echo everything you said about uh, Kid Murdoch or battling Jack Murdoch. Yep. And I love, you know, you know, as Matt is, is reflecting, he notes how, uh, you know, Jack had to have known that all those fights he was winning uh, at his age under the management of someone called The Fixer uh, were not honest fights, but he kept that from Matt, just as Matt, too, was training in secret and keeping that 
you know, from his father. Um, so I really liked, uh, I really liked that angle, uh, to it as well. I thought that that was cool. They have such external differences and so many internal similarities, which I thought was really cool. Like you just said, they both love each other, but however, they both are keeping something from each other that they know would upset the other. Yeah. And, um, they're both doing it with the best interest in mind. For sure, I think with you know thinking of the other person's feelings and what it would do to them, but ultimately, you know, it's it's never healthy to, to keep a secret from a loved one, especially in that you know parent-child dynamic as a uh, as well. So I thought that was an interesting highlight, especially towards the uh, the beginning of uh, the story. Now, when did you get into Daredevil? So I really started getting into Daredevil. So I, I read some comics in the 90s. I, I remembered when Daredevil first got his new uh, black and red costume in the 90s. And sure. it was like the biggest deal ever. <laughs> um, Daredevil, however, really started clicking with me like it did with so many people with the Bendis run. Uh, you know, the now legendary Bendis, Alex Maleev, and leading into uh, Ed Burbacker's run as well on Daredevil, which I'll be honest with you, and this is sacrilege, I think I like Ed Burbacker's run on Daredevil just this much more than Bendis. They're both fantastic. Um, I just, I mean, human, like we're talking about here, human, human stories. I mean, uh, The Devil and Subblock D is unbelievable. I'm shocked we haven't seen that. I know it got uh, canceled off Netflix. I was shocked we didn't see that in some capacity. That's such a good story. I mean, yeah, the, the entire multi-year run, uh, e- even up to now, I mean, Daredevil has had such, you know, I've said the statement before, uh, and argued with a bunch of my friends as well too, especially over a few drinks, uh, that I really believe that you could argue that some characters have had single better stories. Some characters have certainly more popular. I don't think there's been another comic book run even with all the different creators that has the same quality that daredevil has overall if this weren't a pandemic and we and if we weren't uh, doing this virtually i'd give you a high five right now because i'm with i've, I've always virtual one vir- i've always felt the same about daredevil the way that because it's true i mean you know these characters have been around for decades you know a lot of great runs yeah. but the the sequence of runs and the way that the writers have passed the baton off to each other. I see what you did there. With the I did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good Look catch. at you. Yeah. Uh, it was not intentional. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's like, I don't feel like you often see that. And I think it, I mean, I guess we really have to give credit to Bendis because I feel like he, you know, really started that at the end of his run. And, you know, honestly, there will likely be, and I'll, I'll probably hit you up for this when we get there. there I'll probably do at least an episode on, on the Bendis run, you know, if not the ones that followed yep. as well, because it's, it's my favorite Daredevil run as well. Um, and of course, that's the, you know, that's the run where his identity is outed. And, you know, it would have been so easy for Bendis at the end of his run to just be like, you know, to, to wrap it up in a bow, put the genie back in the bottle, whatever. But he really left it in a place where the next writer would really have a lot to play with. And I think that, yep. you know, that has continued. The only, so I'm a, I'll be honest, I'm a, I'm a bit behind. I, I kind of stalled out during the Wade run. And Wade's one of my, one of my favorite writers. It wasn't a lack yep. of enjoyment, um, but I just kind of fell out of it. And so I, I really need to catch up. So I'm, I'm a few years behind uh, at this point. But I really loved, I loved the book for so many years. The Andy Diggle run. Uh, with Shadowland and all that stuff, that was a little that was a little rough. That was a little bump, a little bump in the road. And I, it, not, I'm not saying it was bad, but there was such a high quality bar that was set. And Shadowland seemed like a sweeping consequence on a bit of a grander scale. And what I always loved about Daredevil is that the biggest consequences are for Matt Murdock, him personally, and how that could be as devastating as you know, a scroll invasion or as any kind of major crossover event, you get so invested in Matt Murdock and the characters in his life that his getting his identity outed, the death of a loved one is Matt losing his mind is a a thread that I always enjoyed over the course of, of months and years, because if you stop and think about it, that makes perfect sense considering everything he's been through and what he's doing. They've made those just as captivating and as devastating as any you know, any multi-part, uh, multiple issue crossover hologram cover that you could have ever wanted. Yeah, no, it's, it's so true. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I'm with you like that Bendis run is, is my favorite daredevil run, but I got into daredevil with the Kevin Smith, uh, guardian devil 
arc yep. at the beginning of Marvel Knights. And, I, you know, I, I came in, I was a huge Kevin Smith fan. I, I mean, I, I still am a fan, but at the time, like I was really into uh, all of his stuff. And so, you know, the idea that he was doing dare, like it was, it was perfect. And yeah. I, I love the story a lot. And that's actually going to be uh, in the next episode, we're going to do uh, uh, Guardian Devil and his Green Arrow run, uh, Quiver and Sounds of Violence. So that, that should be a fun one. Uh, right. so I'll talk about that more next time, but, uh, you know, of course, you know, spoiler alert, but it's been 20 years, uh, you know, Karen dies in, in that Kevin mm-hmm. Smith arc. And, you know, that came out really just a couple of years before daredevil yellow. I mean, not, not a ton of time. And, and again, like that was my first story. So it's not like I had much attachment to Karen page. Right. So I, it's fine. Like with a lot of these characters, I knew them, I mean, with Gwen and, and Karen in particular, like I knew them through their death. You know, and yep. these stories, you know, yellow and, and blue, like really just gave me such an appreciation for who they were and what they meant to the characters. And but timing wise, like I think, you know, yellow resonated with me more because I had just read, you know, the the death and seen the immediate aftermath of what it put Matt through. And so now to go back and, and see where they started, because Karen had quite the journey uh, in the comics, especially in the Frank Miller, you know, born again yes. story. You know, she really yes. went through a lot and ended up in a very different place than, you know, when she started as the, you know, sweet little secretary uh, at the law I mean, firm. That's, that's what makes, I think, Daredevil Yellow even more impactful and devastating uh, in a way. You know, it wasn't some, I, I'm not taken away from one of the most iconic moments in comics history with, you know, Green Goblin and Gwen Stacy, but I mean, it was you know, these, I mean, obviously she was forced and had things happen to her, but like, it, you know, it was HIV and, and drug use that killed Karen Page, an enemy that, you know, keeping with the boxing theme uh, that Daredevil can't hit. And that is also something so horrible and so emotionally relatable to everybody to losing somebody to an enemy that you can't swing in and save the day and hit against. And uh, I think, like you said, the the timing of Daredevil Yellow, just a few short years after this, kind of informs what uh, what I thought was very astute that you mentioned about the teens on Daredevil over the years kind of passing their proverbial batons off to each other, you know? Because uh, having read that and now read this, I mean, you, you gain such a deep appreciation and understanding for Karen Page, even if you haven't read, you know, years and years of Daredevil before this. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, this, you know, the story does a lot. I mean, it, it gives us a lot of insight into, uh, you know, again, Matt's relationship with with his father, uh, with Foggy. You know, we see them in their in their yeah. law school uh, dorm and setting up their law practice and uh, the little love triangle that they have with with Karen, where they're both interested. Foggy, Foggy uh, is ready to propose marriage real fast, real, real fast. fast. Poor Foggy. <laughs> They're not poor, even on a first name. Foggy. They're not even on a first name basis at this point, and he's, he's Mr. Ready to Mr. Nelson. <laughs> it's a fun reoccurring gag. It's Foggy. Yeah, I love though. Yeah. You know, you know, Matt has this moment where he's like, you know, he, you know, Foggy has such a sharp legal mind. It's like, how did this guy ever end up with the nickname I'm, Foggy? I'm reading that note I have here right now, and it says, "How do you get the name Foggy?" And I thought that was such a nice compliment. Yeah, as well to uh, uh, the skill and importance of uh, uh, Franklin Nelson as he's also known. And I do feel like a lot of those recent runs we have mentioned have really done a, a, a nice job of highlighting, you know, just mm-hmm. how effective, you know, Franklin is and what he brings to the table. Uh, so I think he, you know, justice has been done for, for Foggy in, in recent years. Uh, but yeah, that was a nice moment and to really show, you know, the respect, um, you know, between the two of them. So I thought that uh, that was a nice, nice touch. He also has what I think is the funniest line in the entire uh, Daredevil Yellow when he says, I would have hit you and the fact that you were blind wouldn't have stopped me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's great. Which is so off color, uh, but I, I just, it had me in stitches again, even after all this time. Yeah, I love that they're pool hustlers as well. Yes. You know, yep. and it's like, you know, it makes sense, like especially as they were working their way like through college and law school, like that's yeah. probably, you know, then, you know, they need some spending money. So that's what they do. It's always the, the fascinating uh, dichotomy of Matt Murdock. You know, he, he believes in the law and works with the law, but he also understands there are times where you can bend things a little bit. Yeah, I know. And I, that's one of the things that makes him, you know, so, so interesting. Um, what else is on your notes? Because as much as I can throw stuff out, I know you have notes. So I want to make sure we, uh, we, we get to everything. Perhaps unsurprisingly are hitting a bunch of my same notes. Oh, the fact that the fixer has a heart attack before Murdock can get to him. And that's either a sad thing or a huge positive, depending how you look at it, because 
would have would Daredevil have brought him in and did the right thing? Or was, since this was the man directly or indirectly responsible for his father's death, would he have crossed a line and been emotional and not been necessarily uh, living up to a value that he would like to have? So I thought that was kind of interesting that that decision was taken away from him. Yeah, I know. That that scene stood out, too. Um, yeah, no, I agree. That is a good question. It's like, what? how far would he have gone? Yeah. You know, if, if he didn't have to make that choice. And that's that's a beautiful shot down underneath the uh, the subways, too, when the cops come. And he's standing there at the yellow cop. Oh, what a, I mean, again, the artwork from Tim Sale, just unbelievable. Yeah. Beautiful. And I mean, that's the thing. It's like, you know, the yellow costume is not the most visually strike. Like the red one works a lot better. But it's like, you know, I think it, wor- it works so well in the story and he, the way he renders this it. This is one of the only times that he's been wearing this costume. And I don't think it looks ridiculous. Yeah. And I think most people agree with me. I actually think it looks really cool. And uh, again, huge shout out to Tim Sale because that's a quite, quite, a, quite a feat to achieve. And, uh, I, he looks great. The costume looks great in this run. What I like, and I know I'm, this is going to kind of cover a couple of the, the, the color books, but what I like is that, you know, they give you these, like we keep saying, these snapshots of these uh, moments early in their careers, but we don't get rehashes of the origin stories. Um, which I appreciate. Like, I think it's more oh, interesting. Me too. You know, I mean, like we see, like we have the quick moment of, you know, Bruce and the gamma bomb, but like it's, it's really more, like in that story, really more of the immediate aftermath, right? That that story yep. deals with. And so, yeah, I like that a lot because a lot of these origin stories, my, Sp- Spider-Man especially, it's, like, it's been done, done to death. I never need to see Uncle Ben die ever again. <laughs> Just, yeah. I never need to see Martha Wayne's pearls falling ever again there there are uh there there are cultural mythology even if you're not a comic book fan you you know what happened to spider-man's family and bruce wayne's parents you know like i don't need to see those origin stories ever again we get it you know let's move on and i agree i like that they take time to acknowledge what happened but it's very quick and you're, you're moving on to uh the meat and potatoes of what they want to get into yeah and that you know like with daredevil too it's like as much as you know i enjoyed uh you know, the Frank Miller man without fear miniseries, but like at the same time, I don't, you know, his training with stick and like all that stuff, like it's not, it's not as interesting to me as, you know, the setting up of the law practice and all the stuff with Karen and the stuff with his dad, like that to me, you know, and so I'm glad that the story really, I mean, these stories, all of them, I mean, they really drill down on, uh, you know, what has the emotional, the most emotional resonance. Um, and you know, it just so happens like that's what I like most about the characters and, and their journeys at, at this point in their career. Uh, so yeah, I like, I like the, I really like the focus that, that each one had, you know, it's relatable. It's uh, it's infinitely relatable for sure. I mean, it, like, I can't tell you, you know, there were so many things that just called to mind the Rocky movies for me and, uh, they didn't in, in Daredevil Yellow, they didn't refer to it as the puncher's chance, but Matt reflects at one point about how, you know, his dad always says, like, you know, it nothing else matters. Like two guys go into the ring and one mm-hmm. of them's gonna win. And it's like that's that to me is always one of my favorite things about uh about Rocky, this idea of the puncher's chance, that it's like it doesn't matter how outmatched you are, you just need to land that like that one good blow and you can win. Uh, I love it. it. So again, like the, the boxing aspect of it, uh, you know, really, <laughs> really worked for me. I enjoyed that a lot. Yeah. And that, that's, that's, that's an important lesson for, uh, for life, you know, even though you're using it in terms of, of boxing, you know, that's such a powerful message that as long as you're present, and as long as you're there and you take a shot, you always have a chance. There's always hope. Yeah. And that's, you know, again, now as, as new dads, I mean, like that's certainly, you know, a lesson that I, I, I mean, I've already said, but it doesn't register yet, but it's like, as he gets older, like I really, you know, that's something that I I really want to, you know, impress upon him that it's like, you got to keep swinging. You got to keep swinging because it's like, you just need to land that one, that one blow and it changes everything. Uh, So yeah, I really love that. I love, and you know, I, maybe this was already part of the origin story, but I love the fact that the Matt's original costume, right. Is, is their remnants of uh, Jack's, uh, you know, boxing, boxing gear. I thought that was cool. He's up for a day or two straight just sewing yeah. and creating the costume yeah yeah what else Very cool. what else is on your notes about daredevil uh kilgrave uh yes. kilgrave was really cool i had like half forgotten he was even in here i, compl- I completely forgot it's so interesting uh, seeing the foresight kind of too because you know kilgrave certainly gained such a renown uh and focus from the netflix series uh daredevil and uh, they knew they had an interesting uh and devastating villain 
uh, there as well. So I was like, boy, talk about being ahead of the game here. You know, obviously this team here realized that this could be a very interesting and a personal foil, a character who can manipulate others into doing what he wants. Such a scary, I mean, I think uh, Kilgrave Purple Man is one of the scariest characters in comic book history, quite frankly. You know, what a, what a terrifying uh, and excellent choice for this story. Uh, do same thing. Like, I, I had completely forgotten he was in it. And, you know, again, it just goes to show, like, how your perspective changes because this is the first time I've read the story since watching the Jessica Jones Netflix series where they yep. used him yep. to, to great effect. And it's like, yeah, I think the first time or the first few times I would have read Daredevil Yellow, I don't know that, like, it just, it, I don't know that it really registered all that much. But, like, now mm. having seen, you know, what his whole deal is, it was like it really colored you know no pun intended it really colored this reading you know very differently for me and you know matt even says he's like you know with other villains and he names a few it's like you know they want world domination or they want money but like he just wants karen and that feels like worse to me or more dangerous yeah. very true and that's, that's it's perfect it goes back to what we're saying about these stories and about daredevil as a whole you know the kind of the majority of the the series run you know it's just those personal those personal stakes are just as devastating as anything that could happen in a comic book yeah no, oh, for sure. Uh, what else? What else? But you also, got? I, I added. I think this is my last note on here. It was awesome seeing the Fantastic Four. Yeah. What a fun! What a fun cameo that they just kind of aim crashing in, and Matt Murdock gets to have this moment, not as Daredevil, but as Matt Murdock going uh, toe to toe with Reed Richards and earning his respect almost right away. I thought that was really cool that not Daredevil, but Matt Murdock gets that moment. Yeah, that was a really cool moment. And you know, I was going to mention this before we wrap, but might as well say it now. You know. Loeb and Sale did four of these books and, you know, I think whether it was stuff that they mentioned in, in interviews or just sort of fan speculation, you know, I think there was always the idea that there would be more of these and I think, you know, Fantastic Four, maybe Iron Man, I think like there were a few that like immediately come yep. to mind. It's like, oh, like it would be really interesting and, you know, we see them use Tony Stark in, in Hulk Gray and that yep. prototype Iron Man costume and, you know, again, the Fantastic Four make their cameo here and it's like, yeah, it's, it's a shame and, you know, it's been a good few years now since Cap White and many years, you know, in between <laughs> Gray mm -hmm. and White. And it's like, you know, I don't I don't know that there are really any more of these really in the cards. It doesn't seem like, you know, right. Uh, they're looking I, to do I them. I don't know if I'd want another creative team to try anything like this either. I just, how could you? You know, that's kind of how I look at it. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, it's like, you know, there's always someone out there, but uh, I don't know. I guess it's the sort of thing. Yeah, for the most part, I'm with you. But I don't know if Loeb and Sale were really like, listen, we're done. And I don't know. There was someone else who like really had a good take where I guess this would be the fine line. Like I would it would be great if they really capture the spirit, but at the same time, weren't trying to just mimic what they did. And, and I don't know if you can find like, I don't know if you can find that line, but if someone could, <laughs> that would be cool. I At the end of the day, I think we're both cheering and opening for whatever talented creative team wants to release stories that not necessarily have to have the color label on it, but are kind of telling these like, uh, you know, this, these stories, this emotional gravitas and character studies. Uh, I think we always want that as comic book fans, as fans of any good writing and art and media. So you'll get my agreement uh, with that completely too. I'm, I hope we see more stories like this and continue to see more stories like this. Yeah. You know, I guess the last thing that I would say about, uh, about yellow, and this kind of leads into, into blue as well. Like it's funny because, for as much as they're about, uh, you know, uh, Karen and Gwen, it's like we don't even see Matt and Karen start a relationship here. You know, Spider-Man Blue ends with the first kiss between Peter and Gwen like that. You know, that's yeah. it. So it's, you know, really about that that road, you know, uh, you know, to that point. And yeah, with Matt and Karen in particular, it's like. You know, they have a few moments like at the bowling alley when she hugs him and he, you know, he talks about, like, oh, the first time like I felt her, you mm -hmm. know, against me and all of that. And, you know, it ends with her really being more infatuated with, uh, with their devil. Mm hmm. You know, it's, uh, uh it's, it's a good point that I hadn't really considered that, uh, we really don't see their relationship. We see the story of how they got there. Yeah. And I think maybe in a way that's, um, the more interesting tale, at least from a, a smaller, more intimate perspective. So one other uh, piece of my fandom that will explain why I love these stories so much. I'm a big How I Met Your Mother fan. 
And that too, go. very bittersweet story. Uh, you know, that's all about the journey and not the destination. And, and yeah. uh, you know, I think that that's, that's, uh, you know, I, I love those types of stories, you know, that's a good correlation that you just made for sure. And, uh, yeah, I think there's a certain, um, hard truth and, uh, emotional intelligence to that where no matter what ended up happening, how you got to that point is often the more interesting story. Yeah, for sure. Uh, all right. Shall we move on to Spider-Man Blue? Let's do it. It's my favorite. It, it's just my favorite. Yeah. And you're, you're not, you're not wrong. You're not wrong. Like I said, it's, it's tough between Daredevil Yellow and Spider-Man uh, Blue for me. They're both just so good. I mean, they're just, they're, they're so good and so emotionally impactful still all these years later as it was the first time I read it. What, like, I mean, there's so much that I, you know, I, I love about it. Um, but what's cool, I really love, it's funny cause I just, I did a, I recorded something recently and it'll be out by the time people see this, but I did uh, with a comic book creator, Ken Mary, and we, we top, we counted down our top 10 favorite fictional characters. And nice. of, of course, Spider-Man was on mine. And in that episode, I went on record as saying that I think the character works best in high school. And I, I, I still feel that way to an extent, but rereading this reminded me how much I love the college age uh, Peter Parker. And uh, even before the, the Clone Saga in the comics in the 90s, you know, really what, what got the ball rolling for me was the, the 90s uh, animated series on Fox. Of course. And, you know, in that he's, you know, a student in college. And so I have I recently rewatched all of it on uh, Disney Plus. Oh, my God. Had, how, it's on uh, there. Had it hold up. Not as well as X-Men in my in my personal opinion. That's still my favorite, but it was still fun. It was still enjoyable. I had a good time. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I went it. I haven't checked it out on Disney plus yet, but I think it was on Hulu for a bit, like a, like a while back. And I remember like watching a few then and yeah, yeah it really took me back. So again, as much as I don't know, objectively, I, I still think the high school setting might be best, but I really love the, I really love the college era of Peter Parker. And so I love that that's, you know, captured here. And I think what this, one of the things this story does so well is, uh, you know, really, capturing peter at this moment of transition and and it's explicitly said in the book right like he was going from peter parker bookworm to you know pete's pete's an okay guy right yep yep and and you see that play out like he doesn't know what to do with the attention that he's getting from these two women and you know it gets messy right like he like gwen is just starting to you know, he's noticing that she's noticing him, but he doesn't really know what to do about it. He doesn't know what it means. He meets Mary Jane. Of course, he's infatuated. She makes an impression. You know, he brings her around the gang. Like, no one knows what to make of it. Like, you know, he, he's, you know, really figuring it out as he goes. And I think this does a great job of capturing him at that transition point. And I agree with your instinct. Bro. I think my favorite Peter Parker Spider-Man is college Peter yeah. Parker Spider-Man because you still get kind of like that... uh that those youthful mistakes, but there's a greater sense of freedom, I think as well. And I think we, it's, that's why this story works. He is free to kind of experiment with dating and being on his own a little more, you know, moving in with Harry, uh, still having Aunt May, you know, not too far away, but enough where, you know, he's kind of on his own a little bit, striking out uh, on his own. So I, uh, I definitely would think this is my favorite time period for, for Spider-Man stories. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the more we talk about it, I, th I think, uh, I think I'm amending my my earlier position. Uh, yeah, he, I think, uh, he, buy, he buys a motorcycle, you know? So, I mean, what's, what's, what's there not to like? It's true. I know, I love that moment where he's like, you know, I've gone up against all these villains and everything, but it's like, you know, spending this much money, like, it's really scary. Yeah. Uh, you know? I'm relatable. <laughs> yeah. You know? And it's like, you know, again, like this whole idea of him being at this transition point. Uh, like, I know, like, you work out, like, you're into fitness, right? Is that something that has always been a part of, of your life or was there like any sort of transformation that you underwent at any point? Yeah, no, it's a, a good question. So I definitely was like more of a heavy set, uh, chubbier kid for lack of a better term for, um, till I hit about middle school, early high school. And, um, I ended up joining the wrestling team in my high school. And while I wasn't that great, a wrestler, if I'm being honest, I really enjoyed the working out uh, I held the weight loss record, or at least I did last time I checked for, uh, my, my high school, um, sleepy hollow high school, which is fun. But I, um, and that just, that kind of stuck with me. It, it taught me the importance of working out. I don't do it to look good. 
the health is a nice side effect. I do it because it gives me a uh, kind of like a mental clarity, which is, which is something that, that I enjoy. I find that I think better in motion, which is something that, you know, I'm reading these stories about Spider-Man and daredevil too. Maybe that was, you know, clinking around in the back of my mind somewhere too. Like, Oh, I'm just going to go for a web swing or a swing around the city and, and clear my head. There's something about being in motion that I think lends itself to reflection and thought. Gotcha. No, I, that's a great point. And, you know, the reason I ask is that, you know, I had a similar journey. Like I, I was, you know, uh, husky as, as a kid and it wasn't until, uh, my freshman year of college when I started working out and, you know, so, you know, like yourself, like I had that, you know, that, that transformative experience and it's like, it does, it does kind of like mess with your head a little bit. Like, I don't, I don't think that it went to my head and I was arrogant about it. I hope not. <laughs> but like, you know, it's like people, see, like you notice, like people are seeing you differently and, and are you For getting sure. compliments or whatever it is? Like it does kind of mess with your head, not, not mess, but it just, again, changes your perception of yourself. And, uh, and again, I think that's kind of what I had in my head. Like when I was reading these scenes with Peter, like, as he was trying to sort all of this out and it's like, you know, he doesn't know what to do with himself. Like he's got these two yeah. beautiful women and it's like, you know, he's not used to having that kind of attention. I, I just found it so relatable. No, that's, a, that's a really, really good point. It definitely went to my head, by the way. I had to learn some uh, important <laughs> life lessons the hard way. Uh, that's another story for another day, I suppose. All right. But um, yeah, for sure, because we're, we're still the same people on the inside, even though people might be looking at us a little differently on the outside. And that's, a, again, a very relatable thing. It's true. And it's like, you know, whether you grow up Oh, you know, overweight or a bookworm or nerd, like whatever it is, it's like you always carry that with you. You know, you always have that. Um, so again, I really, I really found that, uh, you know, so relatable. Uh, I, I dug that a lot. Uh, you know, we do get plenty of Spider-Man action in this as well. Um, but again, yep. it's not like what I, I know I keep saying versions of this, but it, it's so true. I mean, you know, you get a lot of great action and you see in all of these books, like, you know, uh, you know, a lot of the key characters and villains like you would want to see. Um, but that's secondary, right. To the, mm -hmm. to the, to the, the overall story. Um, and so, yeah, like you said, you know, we see Peter, um, starting to forge a friendship with Harry. They become roommates. Uh, we have Loeb and Sales take on the famous, you know, face a tiger, you just hit the jackpot scene. Yep, yep. Uh, you know, Peter being torn between, uh, you know, these two women and trying to navigate that while, you know, as we find out, it's Craven, right, is is putting Spider-Man through this gauntlet of, you know, uh, him facing off against the various villains. So Craven- Because they're learn. all animals, you see. They're all animals, yes. <laughs> of course, it had to be Craven. <laughs> of course. Uh, one of my, you know, one of my favorite moments is when- uh, Peter, is, you know, is, is sick and he's watching, he's got his costume on, he's got his mask in his hand, right? And he's yep. watching from the window as the, the two vultures are fighting. And it's, again, a very relatable moment. I mean, not, not that we're, you know, <laughs> superheroes, but like he it would have been so easy for him to just like let them duke it out amongst themselves. Yeah. And he catches yeah. himself and he's like, you know, the last time I didn't get, didn't bother to get involved, you know, my, my uncle Ben died. And I thought that was a really powerful moment. And that's all the origin story we need, as far as I'm concerned, for this story, too. That was powerful, and it gave us a, an actual current and present example in the story of why he had to do what he was going to do. Uh, yeah, I, I love that scene. Also, a beautiful shot uh, as well, too, of him standing, like you said, with his mask in hand, looking out the giant you know, uh, apartment window, seeing them fight in the, the night sky. I thought that was really cool, too. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, you're right. I mean, that is all the Uncle Ben you need. You know, and it's, yeah, it would have been real easy to tack on a flashback, like at some point, but mm -hmm. this really was all you needed. And like you said, it, it had a uh, resonance in the moment. And I think that made it more effective. And, uh, you know, he mentions uncle Ben really, like a couple of other times. Uh, but, but one of the ones that really stood out is when he says that, you know, Gwen's death, like really haunts him the most. And he's like, and I think uncle Ben would, you know, would understand yeah. And It's like, yeah, he, he certainly would. Yeah. It's, uh, I think he even goes on to say it's, it's, you know, not supposed to be this way. You know what I mean? I, I, you know, uncle Ben, at least, even though it was unfortunate what happened to him, of course, had led up, led up into that point, a full life where Gwen Stacy was just a kid, you know, more or less as well too. And I think that's a, yeah, that's a, that's a very striking, uh, term. It adds a new level of unfairness kind of to everything that's happened. Yeah. Uh, Oh, the, one of the other things as far as just, uh, you know, relatability, and I think an effective depiction of the uncertainty and confusion 
of navigating romance at especially at that age when it's like with Mary Jane in particular like he doesn't know what to make of her attention in particular you know yep. where it's like she keeps calling him like oh Petey's my guy she's hanging it's like he just Give a kiss on the forehead kiss on the cheek he doesn't know what to do he doesn't yeah doesn't know what to do I love it it's so funny it's 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 great and again like we keep going back to relatable I and mean, that's probably why Peter Parker is one of the greatest comic book characters of all time is a uh, no matter who you are there's a little bit of Peter Parker in all of us you know, we've all felt that way. Even if some people pretend like they're super cool or invincible, I promise you on the inside, we've all felt that way uh, at some point. You know what I found interesting as well, too, and I don't know if I realize this, his professor, there's a, a quick throwaway line while they're <laughs> in school, is Professor Warren. Is that the jackal? That's the jackal. I think I might have missed that or either or forgot about that. I was like, oh, my goodness. That's the talk about Clone Saga stuff, right? I was like, hey, there's the jackal. That's kind of a cool little Easter egg in yeah. here, you know? Yeah, I noticed that too. Yeah, that was cool. And yeah, it's just like a brief moment. But yeah, Professor Miles Warren, who would go on to... Yeah, and that's something great because if you don't know who that is, no harm, no foul. But if you do, you're like, huh, they really uh, know what they're doing here. Yeah. You know, so I thought it was a nice little nod. Yeah, you get nice nods like that. And, you know, there's some great scenes with Peter and Jonah. So it's like, you again, you get... Um, you get a nice sort of like greatest hits of, uh, you know, of the characters and dynamics that you would kind of want to see. Uh, so I thought that was really cool. And, you know, as far as the, you know, Peter's big dilemma, right. You know, uh, between pursuing Mary Jane, uh, or, or Gwen, you know, I think the, the series really did a great job of, you know, showing you how different these two young ladies are. And, you know, like with Mary Jane in particular, you know, when she rides with Peter to a crime scene and, and, you know, he's like, oh, I, well, I mean, he, he really needs to change into Spider-Man, but he presents it as, oh, I got to go in to get photos and she distracts right. the cop so he can get in. And it's like, she's right there in the action with him. Like, I think that did a great job of yep. showing like exactly who she is and, and what she brings, you know, to, to the party. That's one of the things I enjoyed so much about the, um, well, I can't say most recent Spider-Man video game because Miles Morales is out now, but the um, the one before that on PlayStation 4, the Spider-Man game, had uh, all these playable sections as Mary Jane, where she was getting in there, getting into the ac uh, action and actively helping. And that's such a big, I think, cool part of Mary Jane, especially from a character who's created so, so, so many years ago to not just be like a, a damsel in distress. It's so important to have these strong female leads and characters who can be as much of an active participant as uh you know the protagonist or the superhero i think that's uh so important yeah uh, i mean what did you think of the depiction of of gwen because again like with mary jane like she really pops and i think it's i don't want to say easy but I, I think there are more natural opportunities to demonstrate like why she would be such an attractive choice you mm -hmm. know to him and i think you know with like sweet and nice, like with Gwen, like, you know, sometimes that can be a little, a little bit tougher. But for me, I think what really, you know, uh, you know, drove it home was, uh, you know, that final scene where, uh, you know, he's changing and she walks in on him and she's like, well, you know, did you get my note? She had sent him a Valentine. And yeah. Then, you know, that was like, oh, like, you know, uh, I don't know. I guess it made me see her in, in somewhat of a different light. But like, what did you think of the way she was presented? I thought her best moment, at least to me, was when uh, we touched on this briefly before, but when they both kind of show up there to take care of a, a flu ridden Peter Parker, uh, MJ comes with like soup and is being all, you know, lovey dovey and touchy. But Gwen comes in with Huck Finn, which was the book that uncle Ben used to read to him when he didn't feel good. And Gwen cared so much that she went to talk to aunt May about what, uh, or overheard, I think she might've said she overheard it, but she knew that this was something that meant so much to him um, that he couldn't have anymore. And maybe that would do more than even make him feel better physically, but on a, a whole nother deeper emotional level. So I thought that to me was like the real, like, wow, like Gwen Stacy is a, a wonderful, wonderful character and a wonderful person. Yeah, no, good point. That really was, uh, it, that really was a standout moment. Yeah, I guess the, the, I maybe the reason I gravitate towards that other that last scene that I mentioned was uh and not that she's like throwing herself at him but I felt like she was she stepped forward and was a little bit more forward than maybe you would typically expect yeah. of Gwen, you know. Uh so so I dug that. You know, the other thing that I was thinking about as I was rereading this uh, and I think one of the reasons why I like it so much is that it is funny cuz you know, I started in the 90s with the Clone Saga and I basically jumped off uh 
I'll be honest with, with brand new day. I got through one more day and oh boy, people were not happy, huh? People were not happy. I yeah. wasn't happy. I mean, I wasn't like up in arms, but I, you know, I, sure, I wasn't, sure. I wasn't thrilled about it. And I read a little bit of brand new day, but it just felt so removed from the Spider-Man. I, that I had forged an attachment to that. I just kind of, right. Know, I, I mean, he's making a deal with Mephesto. Like we're a bit, not as grounded. And I mean, that with all due respect as the stories that maybe we're accustomed to. Yeah, no, exactly. Uh, so, so really like the, the heart of the Spider-Man that I've read has been this married Peter Parker, like from the nineties through one more day yet, you know, you often hear about Spider-Man about like, Oh, like this soap opera aspect. And especially those mm-hmm. earlier comics, which again, like I haven't really delved into. So that's, I think one of the things that was really cool to me. It's like, Oh, like you really get to see that soap opera uh, play out because it's again there weren't I mean I guess maybe more on the ultimate line but as far as like the mainstream Marvel stuff of, of Spider-Man that I've read you didn't really have that dynamic so that was cool to see play out I agree and uh, we you know more or less I feel like started reading comics at the same time so I thought that was a uh, something cool as, uh, for me to read as well because yeah the majority of the time a uh, pre brand new day uh, it was all married Peter and Mary Jane living together uh and all that was just kind of like a distant memory before. So yeah, I'm in the same boat as you with that. Yeah. Is there anything else that's uh, that's in your notes about Spider-Man Blue? There is something unexpectedly that struck me as sad uh, was Flash Thompson, and maybe not for reasons that would have occurred to me before, but now with kind of the the breadth of comics that I've read up until this point. Um, first of all, it's cool that Spider-Man saves him and does the whole amazing fantasy pose as as he has him, which is a nice nod as well. But uh, more so than that. The going away party where he's talking about, like, I want to be a hero too. And I want to do all this. And knowing that he ultimately ends up like losing his legs, Mm -hmm. ends up becoming like agent venom and all this just like crazy unforeseen consequences happened because of Spider-Man and inspiring him with the best intentions to do something right. And, you know, we always talk about the theme of responsibility and I'm not saying that's Spider-Man's fault, but to me, it almost came across as like this tragic unintended consequence you know he's over there thinking he's going to be a hero and he's going to become like a a, a disabled war veteran uh, and then he's going to have this whole other horrible you know government situation with the symbiote suit and all this stuff happened to him it really struck a chord with me more so than i thought it would to be honest with you yeah no that is a really good point you know what i thought you you might say because this stood out to me uh, in, in that with that same scene is i mean what did you think about peter's attitude towards flash's decision because he's like kind of skeptical dismissive of it right of the idea that like oh he wants like this is how he thinks he's going to be a hero i i don't know how how did you think about that there's a line too where he says putting on a uniform makes you braver but not necessarily smarter like he yeah he's he's definitely he is dismissive and doesn't think much of flash and that seems kind of a little out of character for Peter Parker, but he's maybe more human than most other comic book characters. And even if you don't know how Flash spent years and years bullying him, even just from how he's treated him in the first few issues of this story, I think it's easy to understand how he feels that way. I'm not saying he's right to respond that way, right. but you know, he's not a God. He's not, you know, uh, this uh, always taking the high road. He's a human being and he doesn't like flash after years of bullying on him and making him feel less than. So yeah, it, to me, that's even worse. Cause it makes me wonder about like, you know, what kind of reflective guilt could Peter Parker have now, you know, knowing everything that happened subsequently from those chains of events that were set off all those years ago. Yeah. That's a really good, that's a really good point. Um, that's a story I would like to see, quite frankly. Yeah, that is an interesting thread that, uh, you know, if someone were to kind of follow up on that, I think could be could be really interesting. Um, yeah, and I think I pretty much hit on everything that I wanted to say about Blue. Did you have anything else? It's lovely. Yeah. I'm good. It sure it's is. Lovely. Uh, Hulk Gray was maybe the most bittersweet of them all. I don't know because, you know... <laughs> not to jump to the end, but it's like Bruce's takeaway seems to be that like Betty loved him just because of daddy issues. Yep. 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 Very sad. Very, very, very sad. sad. Yeah. 
I mean, like way more, tr- like again, they, you know, with, with all four stories, right? Like they're talking to or about people who were dead, loves that they've lost. Like it, there's, you know, they're all, uh, you know, they're all sad stories to an extent, but like this one really, I got, and I had forgotten to be honest, like it's been a number of years since I read it. And, uh, I forgot that that was sort of like the punchline to the whole thing. And I, I was like, oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh. <laughs> First of all, perfect setup having Doc Sampson there. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah, built in storyline wise, great for somebody to talk to. But uh, Hulk Gray is, uh, to me, a story about good intentioned, irrevocably broken people, nearly all of them. And that's such a bittersweet, like you said, story. Because if you look at what I would describe as the, the main active players in the story of uh, Bruce, Rick, Thunderbolt and Betty, they all have in their minds, at least good intentions and they all express it differently. And oftentimes it it turns out horribly, whether they mean it to or, or not. I mean, just the idea that comparing if anybody's familiar with uh, the, the history of the Hulk, you know, Thunderbolt Ross to me is always like arguably his first and most, uh, important villain, quote unquote. You know what I mean? I, I hesitate to even use the word villain. He's a, you know, a much more, I think, in depth character, especially as time goes on. That's a whole other story. But uh, the idea that they're both monsters, uh, and not in the sense like they're monsters because they do bad things, but they're monsters because they're human beings who have monstrous sides that they can't control. And that is, I feel like I keep saying uh, relatable is like my, my buzzword for this whole story. You know, I think we all either know somebody or can relate to that feeling as well too, which is extremely scary. It's scary to think that you could be the nicest person in the world and get upset one day and do something so horribly out of your character. And to me, that's fundamentally why I love this story. I love the Incredible Hulk. The Hulk's always been fascinating to me because there's no other character I can think of that is in cartoons and on children's lunchboxes, but is also almost this like eldritch horror monster cautionary tale. It's it's such an interesting dichotomy of the character to me. And the story does a good job of highlighting that. Yeah. No, I know that's very true. You know, the, the couple of things that you said, uh, as you were saying that, that, uh, uh, kind of jumped out at me. One was, you know, you had mentioned earlier about how, you know, these stories acknowledge that the narrators might not, you know, be totally reliable. Yeah. And, uh, and that comes into play in a big way, you know, with, with this where, you know, Samson kind of presses him on like, you know, do you think that's how Thunderbolt really was? Yeah. Or is that how you're choosing to remember him, uh, mm-hmm. you know, to justify the animosity and to sort of lessen your own guilt? So I thought that was really interesting and really plays into exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, for, for sure. And uh, it's even, you know, it's even more, uh, I think, as readers with any familiarity with Bruce Banner, it's so much easier to, to question him as a narrator, maybe even so much more than, than Peter Parker or Murdoch, certainly with his host of issues and, uh, and, and how he is. And I'll just take a quick moment to throw this out there. If you or anybody listening has not read the current run of Immortal Hulk uh, by Ewing, you definitely should it is one of the greatest Hulk runs of all time. I put it up there with Peter David and this. Um, it is unbelievable. And it's more of that like horror kind of uh, take to things. So just a quick aside, not to get us off topic. Uh, it's cool though, reading this and then seeing how this kind of connects with that humanistic monster kind of theme as well too. So that was kind of fun for me. Interesting. You know, that's been recommended to me. I haven't read it yet. You know, it's funny. I've read a lot of Daredevil and I've read a lot of Spider-Man. Um, I've read a decent amount of Captain America, uh, primarily the the Ed Brubaker stuff, not a ton yep. otherwise. Uh, Hulk, I haven't read much. Um, and I know obviously Peter David had that, you know, lengthy legendary run yep. uh, that I certainly know of, but I've, I've not read. Uh, I really got into Hulk. I read the Paul Jenkins run mm-hmm. and I read probably like maybe the first two thirds of the Bruce Jones run that came after it. Um, and that's it. And, you know, I, I, there's an upcoming book club episode where I'm going to, I'm going to read uh, the Red Hulk stuff by Loeb and McGinnis. 
Uh, uh, which well, I'm, that ties in perfectly to what we're talking about here. Exactly. Yeah. So I'm curious to check that out. But, but I, you know, my point is like, I haven't read a ton of Hulk, like enough that I have, you know, the context and, you know, just generally, like I know the, the broad strokes of the character and his history, sure. but uh, I came into this one certainly with less, less knowledge and less expectations too, I suppose, um, you know, uh, for the story. Um, but you know, still, still really dug it a lot. And yeah, Immortal Hulk, I, that's, that's on the list. We'll, we'll get to it. If you want to read it, let me know. Cause I would love to talk about it. It is, um, it's so good. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. No spoilers. You should be surprised. It's so good. All right. Right on. Uh, but yeah, so, I mean, there are a lot of interesting things. I mean, yeah, it, this one really is, I think more, more tragic than the others. Uh, mm -hmm. but I think naturally so, I mean, it's, you know, uh, he transforms into this monster, I, you know, so I think it, I think the tone, <laughs> you know, is, is fitting, uh, given that we're, you know, dealing with, um, you know, dealing with the Hulk. I mean, I guess, you know, one thing that, uh, I thought was interesting is, you know, Samson kind of, I love the framing device, right? I love all the framing mm -hmm. devices, but this one in particular, as opposed to, you know, Matt writing a letter or Peter just talking into a recorder, like here you had a back and forth. Yep. Yep, I agree completely. And I thought that was really cool, um, especially because Samson really does push him. And, you know, this idea of, like, why did you even save Rick in the first place? And, you know, Bruce is like, well, like, he, you know, he didn't deserve to die. But it's like, well, should you die instead? You know, like that whole idea. I thought that was, uh, that was interesting. I'm staring at that note yeah. right now. Again, uh, you're hitting all the, the same, the same notes that pretty much I, I picked on too. And Samson asked him, did he want to die? from running into the blast from the guilt of building the bomb. Is that, is that possible? Is that why, which adds a whole nother context and layer to his origin story. Yeah. You know, is, is the Hulk itself, his manifestation of guilt as well as anger and rage over what, what he did. You know, I feel like that's so influenced by, by history, whether it's Oppenheimer or Einstein and all this stuff too. And then the development of these weapons and I, that's such a, it's something that when you hear makes complete sense. And I feel like it's so easy to overlook and forget about such a, a powerful, powerful way to start a character kind of in their beginning. Yeah. Well, it's true. I mean, and especially even just like with these characters that we're talking about for these miniseries, it's like, you know, Matt is blinded, you know, saving someone. Right. And Peter, you know, it's, well, depending on which run you're talking about, according to Straczynski, you know, the spider sought him out, but you know, generally it's like, <laughs> that's, that's, that's it. Listen, I like Straczynski. I do. I, I do. But that's another story for another day. That was, I, I don't, did we need that? I don't know if we needed that, but that's fine. It's just as a, as a quick tangent, I'll just say, and especially now it's like lifelong Superman fan, right? And I'm, I'm doing this other Superman podcast and exploring, you know, uh, you know, a lot of different aspects of the character. It's like, you know, with these characters who've been around for so long, you know, they're, the mythology is so rich. And I think there's always, you know, there are always ways to sort of like find new angles or add new layers. Um, but at the same time, it's like, you got to be careful because sometimes it's just like a step too far. And, you yeah. know, with the yep. Spider-Man origin, it's like, I don't know that you needed to add that layer to it that it's like, oh, the spider sought him out. I, I you know, I think the possibility of it is fine. Like, I, cause in that story, like initially, and I think it was presented more as like a, you know, more of like a theory and Peter wasn't sure if it was true or not. And if it, they had left it there, I think I, I would have been okay with it. It didn't, I didn't need like to take it for Like a last page, no dialogue, silent <clears throat> nod. I would have been completely fine with it. Yeah. Cause just ask, asking the question is perfect. Showing me everything and going on and on, I think is too much. I'm not a big fan of mysticism in my Spider-Man. Yeah. And I mean that with all due respect to Madame Webb, who is an awesome and I think very cool character. It's just, I think both of us, and that's why I think we're gushing over all these <laughs> stories. We, we like these grounded humanistic stories. You know, I think there comes a point where you take a character like uh, Peter Parker, who I think is more interesting than Spider-Man. You, you, you start pushing him in all these uh, for extended period of times, like these mystic kind of realms and out of his pay grade once in a while, that's fun. But when you start making it a part of his history, to me, I think that becomes a little bit much. Yeah, for sure. Um, but anyway, circling back. So, yes. but, you know, so Spider-Man, you know, traditionally, right. It's, you know, he, he, it's random, right. That he's there during this demonstration and he's bit by the mm -hmm. spider. And, and of course, you know, Steve Rogers wants to serve his country as part of this, yep. you know, uh, but with Bruce, it's like, yes, there is this act of heroism where he's trying to save Rick, but it's like the, the background of this is that like, yeah, they were <laughs> working on this weapon. Yeah. 
you know? And so. it seems also even more out of character for Bruce because Bruce is not heroic by nature. I think it's something he learns definitely more and more as he goes along, but he's not internally and naturally heroic the same way that Peter Parker or Matt Murdock is. I think that's something interesting to consider too, like why he was running out there. Also, yeah. you know, why was it him that was running out there? Like Samson says, is an interesting question. Why was it him? Why not, you know, somebody else? And maybe they didn't want to, maybe all the, the people there were horrible, awful people. Sure. But like we just said, how uh, just asking the question is enough, just like here, asking that question is enough and is so powerful. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I mean, obviously, a lot of the story deals with, um, you know, with with Betty, um, with the Hulk, you know, trying to trying to get to her and eventually, you know, take he inadvertently, um, you know, harms her. Um, and then, he, you know, he takes her away. And, and so, you know, that that certainly gets a lot of play. I mean, I don't know. Do you have anything in your notes about uh, about the, the Betty of it all and that dynamic? Yeah, I mean, really, to me, uh, well, the most interesting thing about Betty, I think, is what's revealed at the end with her, yeah. I think, mm -hmm. because, you know, she's kind of almost this reluctant, I don't want to say damsel in distress, because she's more than that, but she's just almost like this, this object of affection for the Hulk, who can't understand why, until we kind of flip it at the end, and you see why she would be so attracted to him to begin with. Um and I don't know if that setup is as powerful unless you have her kind of just constantly being like chased and captured right. by the Hulk through this whole, this whole time as a setup. I thought the more effective uh, cameo uh, or I guess, I guess cameo might be the right word. I don't know. in this whole story was Tony Starks because as much as I thought fantastic four was cool coming in one, something that really struck me about, uh, Tony Stark suiting up as Iron Man here is this is also early on in, in Tony's career. You know, nobody knows that he's Iron Man yet, all that stuff. He's drinking. Yeah. Uh, uh, what seems to be like a lot. And again, just like we talked about guilt, which I think is such the big theme of this book. Um, I have in my notes here, like, is he drinking because, you know, it's a lot of people know, even from the movies, Tony Stark, alcoholic, is he drinking really because of his excessive guilt? because he's he's there as well too i thought that was such an interesting choice to have him be be drinking there and maybe even though i feel like we've seen we see uh you know bruce and tony showdown in this we see them fight they fought in the most recent avengers game they often they often quarrel all through all mediums and movies everywhere he has a hulkbuster armor for goodness sake named after what would be one of his sometimes allies I never really occurred to me so reading this how truly similar they both are not just because they're geniuses and our science bros, and I mean that with all due respect to the Marvel movies, but on, on, a, on a deeper level, that they're both responsible for creating horrible weapons of mass destruction and must harbor this kind of terrible internal guilt. And seeing him there drinking and having him, the choice of it being him there, uh, and also finding out that he wiped that encounter from the Avengers records as well, too. Yeah. As proof that it's something he's ashamed of, I thought was so powerful and such an interesting connection that I didn't really realize as fully as I did till I read this again. Yeah, you're right. I, yeah, again, the Fantastic Four thing was cool, but I mean, this really, uh, you know, thematically like really ties a lot together. Uh, yeah, I think the use of, of Stark was, was really effective. Uh, yeah, the battle between the two of them, I mean, you know, Betty has to try to, you know, uh, pull Hulk, you know, off of the robot. Yeah. <laughs> There's the a robot, man inside. robot, yeah. <laughs> the, the bunny rabbit scene uh, was, was, uh, especially tough oh, to boy. tough to <laughs> tough to read you just wanted to pet the rabbits you know that's yeah. that's it that was brutal yeah I, I i really um enjoyed the uh shot of hulk's reflection in the mark one helmet that is something that i would not mind to have a poster of framing somewhere that's just to me that shot was absolutely beautiful yeah there's some i mean there's a lot i mean there's so much cool stuff like when uh after one of the battles with the army when uh rick you know uh finds you know, now Bruce, you know, transformed back from, from the Hulk. And Bruce is like, how did you find me? And then we get like this gorgeous two page spread of like this yeah. trail of destruction. And it's like, one thing that was hard to buy was this idea that, uh, cause they talk about it in the therapy session, right? Like that no one's ever gotten killed. Yeah. I, I mean, that, that, that to me is how Bruce is expressing uh, maybe like the se the series of events, or maybe it was more cover ups during his time. We've already seen yeah. Stark cover up stuff before, but yeah, no, Hulk has 
definitely killed people. Yeah. Intentionally and intentional and unintentionally uh, both. He has most certainly killed people. The Hulk is not a hero. He's not a hero. And there are times where like, yes, like he he's heroic. But if we're talking about the, the purest essence of Bruce Banner and the Hulk, they're not heroes. They're like a living, breathing, extreme manifestation of what it means to be a human and what it means to be a monster and everything that gets you from point A to point B. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, Rick, obviously, too, you know, he plays a big role in this. And, and, you know, that's a very interesting dynamic. I mean, you would have and I'm sure this has been explored in, in the comics that I haven't read. But, I mean, you have to imagine like the, you know, it's not surprising that, you know, Rick is so loyal and tries to help to the extent that he does. I mean, the guilt that he must feel for, yeah. you know, being the one responsible for uh, for Bruce going out there in the first There's place. There's that theme again of guilt. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Definitely a driving theme uh, in, in this book. Um, and yeah, the reliability or unreliability of the narrator, you know, in terms of, you know, his recollection of Thunderbolt and of Betty as well. Like he, you know, says to Samson, like, I might be remembering Betty more, you know, the way she was, you know, later in, in her life, yep. you know, than necessarily how she was at the time. Uh, but yeah, really that punch to the gut of an ending of this idea that, you know, uh, you know, both Bruce and Thunderbolt are, are monsters. And that's why Betty was drawn to, to Bruce. Yeah. It's a, it's a, a poignant and, uh, bittersweet as you said uh ending kind of cap for the story overall it really frames everybody in a a sad but very compelling way yeah and i give the, you know i give them credit for ending it on that note because i think it would have been real easy to to not you know to end it more like the other stories where uh you know it's um Hopeful is not the right word, but definitely, uh, you know, it doesn't, pa doesn't have like, like that, uh, that, that little twist. And I thought that was a cool mm -hmm. way to, to kind of put a different spin on this. For sure. And it's, it's thematic with the character. Yeah. Very I fitting as well too. For sure. Uh, we've already been talking for an hour and a half, but, uh, we got to talk about, uh, about Captain America white. I'll be yes. honest. Um, I don't have like a ton to say about, about white. Uh, certainly not, not as much as I did about the other books. Um, I liked it overall, um, but... You're saying the same thing I'm going to say. I can tell already. Okay. No, mm -hmm. I mean, I just think... I mean, I already said, like, you know, the main way that it's different from the other ones is, you know, the different type of loss that we're dealing with. And mm -hmm. I don't know if the story is just not as effective or if it's just, like, you know, my expectations were, you know, set a certain way based on the prior three. But this one didn't grab me as much. And I will be... The last thing I'll say, and then I'm going to turn it over to you... As a new dad, right, I thought that I actually would uh, identify with this more, uh, you know, with the, again, more, it's more of a brotherly bond between the two of them. But, you know, there's that, um, you know, familial and, and to an extent a paternal dynamic as well. And I thought that would resonate with me more. And again, the story just didn't grab me as much as I wanted it to. What about you? I agree 100%. I'm not saying it's 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 still good. Yeah, it's for a, sure. It's a fun, a fun story, but compared to the extremely high bar that was set by the three before them, and I think you're right. I think it does have to do with um, the the switch of the emotional relationship that's the core. Also, maybe the time with which it was released. I don't I don't necessarily know if that affected anything that happened here. But it's not it's it doesn't have the same um, impact to me lasting emotional impact that the other three have i don't walk away with it being like uh like here's this one moment that really kind of took the wind out of me yeah you know that kind of kind of affected me the way the other three did i think it's still a great story i think it's a lot of fun at parts um it does a lot of interesting things. It's cool seeing all these characters during World War II, as uh, as it usually is. Um, I didn't realize or remember that Bucky's name is because Buchanan was both a uh, President Buchanan, J. Buchanan, was a president and an acrobat, and that's why his name is Bucky. Oh yeah, I I didn't <laughs> I found I found that in there, and I was like, huh. I wonder if that's like actually been said anywhere else. That's something I thought was kind of interesting. Um, it's cool seeing Fury. It's cool seeing uh, Dum Dum. You know, a, a bunch of these characters. But I feel like that this story could have been told by, a, and this is going to sound like an insult, and it's it's not. But this story could have been told by any number of creators. Where I feel like the other three could not have been told by anybody else. 
that's I think a, a great way of putting it. I, I would agree with that. I think I think you hit the nail on the head with it there. Yeah, it just and it's weird because again, like it has obviously the same you know the same creative team and the same overall style and vibe. But yeah, it just doesn't pop the way the way the others did. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I don't know. I I think for me too, part of it was probably. Uh, the fact that I have the movies in my head so strongly and yep. there you had a different dynamic with Bucky and Cap, you know, where, you know, here really like Bucky's the, the I mean, they do play up the angle that like, you know, Bucky's had, you know, a more experience, especially with girls mm-hmm. and stuff like that. But like, I don't know, I felt it, uh, again, I think I just had a certain image of my, in my head of the movies. I was probably also too, you know, wishing that this were like the other color books, you know, like a love letter to, you know, to Peggy Carter, you know, like that sort of thing. Um, Would you think that would have lent itself like perfectly now that I think about it also too, like thematically, right? To the other three. Yeah. I mean, I know it was, I mean, I don't know. It's hard to say, like on the one hand, you give them credit for trying something different, but at the same, but at the same time, it's like you've established you know, a, a, a method of telling these stories and they mm-hmm. all have one thing in common. <laughs> yes. Yes. And it was, I don't know, it was just an odd choice to me. I mean, I know, you know, Loeb, you know, he, he did lose his son and I yeah. wonder if that might have informed the choice, uh, you know, to focus the story on, on Bucky instead. I mean, I, I don't know, but yeah, it just, you know, but, and, but it's funny cause like even factoring in like, Hey, we had these three love stories and now this is a different type, even, taking that into account, it's like, I still think this could have worked, but I, I don't know exactly what it was that it just didn't, um, uh, it just didn't resonate the way I, I, I thought it would. Yeah, I, I agree. It didn't, it didn't carry the same uh, emotional gravitas that I felt like the, the other three, uh, before that, I think this is probably, and I, I've enjoyed, I've seen all the Marvel movies, the shows, I enjoy them quite a bit. I do. This is however, still one of the only times where I actually think I don't mean all of comics, but if I'm just comparing Captain America White to Captain America, the first Avenger, Mm -hmm. I think I actually prefer the relationship between uh, Steve and uh, Bucky in the movie uh, as I do to this. I think I enjoy them more as contemporaries, maybe. And I'm not exactly even sure why that is. Maybe because a part of me thinks it's terrible that the United States government wants to send children into war. Uh, there's even a line about that in here that says the president likes the idea of a teenage sidekick because it would help recruit young soldiers. And I was right. like, huh, <laughs> that doesn't sound so great out of context, you know? Yeah, no, that's true. I, no, I mean, like I said, I, I think, I think it was a mix of things you know, again, the fact that this took a different path than, than the other ones, uh, the fact that, like I said, you know, I had this certain image, um, you know, of, of the characters and of their relationship from the movies, uh, that's now so ingrained in me. I mean, it's funny. It's mm-hmm. like, you know, cause again, like I had read cap before, but you know, the movies really made a big impression. And so, uh, you know, I think kind of all of, all of those were, were factors. Um, I mean, yeah, the story itself is fine, right? Like it's set earlier in the war, like, you know, years before, you know, Bucky will die and cap will, mm-hmm. you know, will, will, uh, you know, go, go underwater. Uh, and you know, we're in the action with cap and Bucky and like you said, fury and the howling commandos. And it's, you know, it's a fun enough war story, but, uh, yeah, I don't know if there's just not enough there with, with Steve and Bucky, uh, to, you know, to, to really work. Yeah. I think, uh, that's exactly it. I, I, there's, there's a lot going on, but I just don't think there's enough Steve and Bucky. I think that's a, you, you hit the nail on the head with that. You know, we needed more of that relationship, I think. Yeah. I mean, I do love when like they get blown uh, out of the air at one point and they're in the water and Bucky has yep. to cut off the shield to, to say that was great. Like that was a cool moment. I think that was my favorite part of, yeah. of reading it. I think because that to me, you learn so much about those characters and who they are and their relationship by him. Uh, it was, I think the most emotionally powerful, at least to me, moment in the whole story is, you know, Bucky being terrified and so upset that he willingly let go of Captain America's shield. Yeah. And he's so scared and upset and sad, not because it's Captain America's shield, but you can tell he really cares about Steve and that he doesn't want him to be upset or disappointed. And of course we see uh, 
Steve, you know, floating in the water, telling him he did the right thing and goes on and gives those speeches about hope to everybody, which uh, that, that whole that whole scene of them uh, in the in the water when the plane goes down is my favorite part of Captain America White, without a doubt. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, so there's definitely some good stuff in there. Uh, and, you know, that's the thing. It's like the worst color book in the series. <laughs> like, right. It's still it's still a story well worth reading, you know, so it's not sure. like, uh, you know, I would never say like, oh, that's trash. Like, no, I mean, I think it's definitely worth reading. And in fairness, it's like, you know, clearly you and I were very moved. And I think a lot of readers, but, you know, we were very moved by the earlier entries, I think, especially Daredevil mm-hmm. and, and Spider-Man. And, For sure. you know, f- being moved like that is not something you always get from, you know, mainstream superhero comics right and and so you know i think it's really a testament to those earlier stories that they achieve that maybe it's unfair to like expect that you know to be moved in the same way like that's 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 a that's kind of a tall order so uh you know for sure it is i wonder if the uh actual publication order had been switched if uh our perception would be different at all i you know that's such a great point. And I think, I, do, I really do think that's part of the problem with this is that it's just like, you know, they set, they created, you know, a set of expectations based on their prior work. And so, yeah, I agree. I think if this had been the second book and it's like, well, okay, mm-hmm. like, so we have a lost love and then we have, you know, we have Bucky, you know, um, and then I don't know, like maybe if, you know, they had, instead of Hulk, like it had been Fantastic Four or something where there maybe it's not so much yeah. a case of like, you know, I don't know what angle they would take necessarily with uh, with Fantastic Four, like the loss of their humanity now that they're, I mean, I don't know, but but that might have affected things too, because then you would have had a little bit more variety in terms of what the story, but this is very much like, which one of these is not like the other one? Right, oh, w- without a doubt, and like you said, it's still definitely a story worth reading, but it definitely stands out yeah. uh, as not being uh, in the same lane completely as the three before it. And I remember when this was coming out, uh, I don't know if it was when the actual like issues one through five or it was the zero issue, but I like remember some of the chatter like at the comic shop, people really didn't seem like they were into it the way they were the other ones. And so I kind of always yeah. had that in the back of my mind and I, I kind of prepared myself for that going into this. Um, but still glad that I finally read it. You know, this was a great opportunity because yes. I'm, you know, while it wasn't my favorite and in fact it was my least favorite, but I'm still glad that I read it and uh, you know, it's been years. So I'm glad that I finally got to it. Same here. Same here. It's nice to uh, to read them, read this, and read all of them again. And again, thank you for giving me uh, a very good reason to read about and talk about you know some of my favorite comics of all time. Yeah, no, my pleasure. I'm so glad that you know you were excited to do this. Was there anything else that you wanted to say about either the individual stories or the the works as a whole? Anything that we didn't get to that you want to say before we part? Uh, if for any reason you're listening to this podcast. And it's probably not likely that you haven't read these yet if you're listening to this podcast, I would bet. But if you haven't, please, 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 if you read one comic this week, this month that you wouldn't normally read, please give these a shot is what uh, what I'd like to say to everybody who's listening. And if you do read it, you got two people here who would probably love to talk about it forever. I will always love to talk about uh, stories that are so moving and so relatable uh as these classics that we've been talking about today so go read them i hope people will take that to heart uh and yeah i mean these these are you know immensely rereadable uh you know i mean again i I'm trying to remember like how many times it's been, but like yellow and blue in particular, I mean, I've read those yeah. at least a handful of times now over the years. Same here. Yep. And I anticipate that they will sort of forever remain in the reread rotation. And they're, they're quick reads too, you know, yep. uh, you know, they're only six issues. Um, and they, you know, I wouldn't say they're fast paced, but they're not a slog. I mean, I think they, you know, they, you know, they move along at a, at a, you know, at a good pace and, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was really a lot of fun revisiting them and, and comparing notes. Literally. I appreciate that you, uh, that you came with notes. Oh, I, I always come prepared, man. That's a <laughs> part of who I am, I guess. Yeah. Right on. Uh, well, listen, thank you so much. This really was a lot of fun. Uh, I suspect I'll rope you into uh, additional book club episodes <laughs> in the future. No no rope necessary. This has been a, a pleasure. And uh, yeah, I'll be happy to do it, man. It's been a, a blast talking comic books with you. Awesome. Uh, well, thank you, Jeremy. Thank you to uh, everyone who listened or watched. We'll be back with an all new episode in two weeks. We'll be covering uh, Green Arrow and Daredevil by Kevin Smith. So that should be a lot of fun. Uh, so we'll see you in two weeks. And until then, remember, they're all imaginary stories. 
My Comic Shop Book Club is a Flat Squirrel production. Art by Kristen San Gregorio, music by Basic Printer. If you like what you heard, be sure to check out my other podcasts, Digging for Kryptonite and My Comic Shop History. Sign up for exclusive content, including the official book club companion podcast at patreon.com slash Anthony Desiato and watch my documentary film, My Comic Shop Country, out now on Apple TV and Amazon.